All right, the Zoom room is filling up and you know what time that means it is. It's eight o'clock on Thursday night. It is time for Football Letter Live. Welcome everybody in. Roger Williams already beaten me to the punch there. Here, right here in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, here in Happy Valley. Kevin Lashane, good to see you. Two uh, of our repeat customers here on Football Letter Live. Steve Catch, class of 82 from Bethlehem. And Russ Mitchell, another regular here on Football Letter Live up there in Syracuse, New York. I remember our uh, in-stadium announcer used to pronounce it that way when we would play them <laughs> from Correct. time to time. Pat Nicoletto and Mark Johnson. Joe Clifford from Cunningham, Pennsylvania. How are you, Dad? <laughs> John Hess joining us from Westchester, class of 87. John was in class with uh, one of our guests tonight. We'll be talking with Bobby White. Uh, I believe we, we have to get him to confirm this, but I believe Bobby was a two-time national champion while he was at Penn State. I think he was on the roster for that 82 team and then obviously a captain of our 86 team. We're also joined by some wildly talented students from our comm radio program here this evening. We'll be getting started in just a minute or two. Thank you for joining Football Letter Live. And thank you to our audience on Facebook Live. I appreciate you all tuning in. If you have questions tonight for any of our guests or for John Black, uh, put them in the Q&A box or in the comments there on Facebook. We will be getting started here in just a minute. I see Marie Boltz from the class of 59 back again for another episode and Linda Rowan uh, from the Ogons slash Abington campus class of 78. Gary Moles from Annapolis class of 77. Good to see you all. We have a great program lined up for you this evening. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to Football Letter Live. We are here every Thursday night, as long as we're playing football. Uh, tonight, we welcome students from Com Radio and national champion Bob White, who will share insight and perspective on the 1986 national championship team. We are encouraging, encouraging you to share questions for our hosts and our guests tonight. You can use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar or ask the question in the comments on Facebook Live. Tonight, as always, I'm joined by the legendary editor of The Football Letter, John Black. John, good evening. How are you? Good evening, Paul. I'm fine. Hope everybody else is the same. Well, I'm doing great. I am looking forward. What happened be last week is behind us. So as we look forward to Ohio State, what are the keys to the game, John? Well, I'll be happy to talk about those. I thought I had a, uh, to take a few seconds just before then to point out that Penn State lost a great athlete and a great leader this past week when Jesse Arnell, class of 1955, uh, died at the age of uh, 86. Jesse was an All-American basketball star, still holds the record in rebounds uh, at Penn State and uh, remains third in scoring, despite the fact that uh, today's game has speeded up quite a bit from 1955. But uh, Jesse was also an honorable mention All-American as a tight end in football and was the first black student body president at Penn State. Uh, he 
served in the Air Force and the Peace Corps and became a successful attorney in San Francisco and spent uh, several years as a trustee of Penn State, crusaded for greater opportunity for uh, black students at Penn State. I was a recipient of the Alliance Paul Medal and Distinguished Alumnus Award. Uh, one other thing that I ought to throw in to start out here, uh, if anybody doesn't hasn't seen the news yet, Wisconsin and Nebraska game this year, uh, this weekend has been canceled. It's become the first Big Ten uh, game to be canceled because of uh, COVID issues. Uh, there were six positive tests by athletes and six by staff, including uh, Paul Christ at uh, Wisconsin. That I believe, I believe is the 37th uh, FBS uh, game that has been canceled uh, in this uh, COVID racked uh, season. Okay, well, uh, looking at the keys of the game, I mean, Penn State has really played uh, tougher against Ohio State in the last four years than any other uh, school in the ben Big uh, Ten. But uh, to pull off that uh, upset uh, this Saturday against uh, a double-digit, uh, 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 you know, against uh, a double-digit uh, favorite, uh, Ohio State, uh, I think the Penn State offense has to make big plays. And uh, now we don't have a, a Saquon Barkley this year. Uh, uh, and often, fortunately, we've had major injuries to uh, our running top running backs, expected top running backs this year, uh, Journey Brown and uh, Noah Kane. So uh, I think uh, we're going to, well, it, it made me think off uh, one thought there initially that uh, our new offensive coordinator, Kirk Shiroka, uh made the comment after coming to Penn State, uh, he could sleep a lot better uh, knowing that Penn State had such a stacked running back room. <laughs> he must be having nightmares now, I'm afraid, but uh, who knows? We've got uh, two uh, talented uh, true freshmen behind uh, Devin Ford, and they're, they're going to play their hearts out, I'm sure. Uh, and we, but we probably have to be ready to rely on uh, quarterback Sean Clifford, not only to have a great uh, passing game as he did last week, except for the two uh, interceptions, but to have a great running game. Paul Clifford actually ranks number one in the Big Ten right now in total offense from last week's game with 357 yards. So I think there's going to be a, an awful lot on his shoulders uh, on Saturday. Of course, Ohio State doesn't have a, a, a J.K. Dobbins this year either, but uh, they do have Justin Fields, who is both a great running quarterback and an outstanding passer. Justin actually committed to Penn State uh, several years ago, uh, and after about a year, he was torn away by his uh, home state university, uh, Georgia, uh, so he flipped his commitment to Georgia, but only spent uh, uh, a summer and a semester there before transferring through the portal to Ohio State last year, where he was actually a Heisman candidate. Uh, well, uh, I say he's an excellent runner. He had 54 yards last week against uh, Nebraska and completed 20 of 21 passes. So obviously the chart... Uh, the, the problem, I mean, the challenge that our uh, Penn State defenders uh, face is uh, controlling uh, Justin Fields, who makes that Ohio State offense go. Uh, Penn State defensive ends hosted three sacks and 15 pressures last week against Indiana's Michael Penix. Uh, so they're probably going to have to do an even better job against uh, Justin Fields this week and the secondary must uh, play exceptional ball against uh, Ohio State's plethora of uh, good receivers. And our defense, of course, is also gonna have to play at least through the first half without uh, Jesse Lukita, who unfortunately was called for a targeting penalty in the second half last week and has to sit out the first half of this, uh, this week's game. So that's the challenge ahead, but I'm sure our team will give it every, every shot to come out victorious. 
Absolutely. A big hill to climb this weekend. Eliminate the mistakes from last weekend, right? Uh, from an offense that still racked up over 400 yards in offense, from a defense that held Indiana in check pretty much all day. I couldn't agree more about our defensive ends. It was a coming out party for Joey Porter Jr. And Shaka Tony played, played really well. Yeah. Um, uh, the, our, our audience is asking us to talk about the last two minutes of the Indiana game. And, and we had said we're not going to talk about it. But, John, I think that the only thing that I will say about the Indiana game is that um, the way we played, um, we did not deserve to win the game. And yet there's no way we lost that game on that last play. So, uh, I, I have not seen a replay or an angle where um, – where it, it in any way resembles a two point conversion. Um, I don't think he got in the end zone. Uh, but I don't think look, he did that's, either. Yeah, that's think... behind us, right? <laughs> well, it's behind us. Uh, we had our, we certainly had enough opportunities to win the game earlier. And it was not just a, you know, that, that last play uh, call. Yeah. A great reminder in the chat from Judy that today is the, Ninth anniversary of 409, uh, Joe Paterno's last win as uh, right. the head coach. Uh, I believe that was the Illinois game, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, that we won in the 2011 season. But first home game coming up on Saturday. The Buckeyes are coming to town. And like you said, John, we're going to be ready to play them. We always play them tough. We always And have... the stadium <laughs> is going to look fantastic. Uh, I have seen some pictures. Oh. Uh, where there are cardboard cutouts already. Um, and uh, the Alumni Association in partnership with um, in partnership with the Lion Ambassadors uh, will once again have the S zone represented in Beaver Stadium. You can see it on your screen. Uh, you can see it on your screen right here. Uh, an S zone banner, stretching over 800 seats, something like 25 rows uh, in Beaver Stadium. Uh, and so the S Zone will be there, sponsored by the Alumni Association and Lion Ambassadors and the Blue White Society. And what makes this so special is that we're taking the opportunity to honor the class of 2020 and the class of 2021. Every one of those class members' names will be in uh, the background on that S Zone banner. And so as I can see, Goodyear Blimp will be in town this weekend. I could see them zooming in down on the S zone, down onto the names of those students here at Penn State whose time uh, has been just, uh, their time on campus has been so altered by COVID-19. And so mm -hmm. just another way that the Alumni Association, uh, a nod to them and, uh, and their uh, unforeseen, the unforeseen impact that COVID-19 has had on their uh, senior years, if you will. I'm, well, I'm trying to get a, a head start here on our virtual whiteout uh, this weekend. We trust that all Penn State fans watching the game will be wearing their white and we'll be doing our best to have that spirit uh, show up in Beaver Stadium, even if uh, we're not all there personally. Absolutely. We also have a contest going on. We're also planning a game day prize pack contest for members uh, at each home game or each home game week so to enter visit our instagram page with the handle at penn state alums that's instagram at penn state alums and uh you can see on the screen uh and click on the post uh at the top with the s zone t-shirt to learn more about how you can get entered into this contest and win that great prize pack that we had john some great guests joining us let's bring them into the show right now all right. Um, we have some com radio students with us tonight. Uh, first, joining us, he's uh, out of Moon Township. He's a class of 2020 member. Uh, he is the production manager and a journalism. Uh, he's a, I'm sorry, production director and journalism manager for com radio. Derek Hyde, how are you tonight, Derek? Hey, how are you guys doing? All right. <laughs> Joe Skinner from South Riding, Virginia. Joe's a member of the class of 2021. He is the student general manager of Com Radio. He's also a broadcast journalism major. He's cutting class to be with us here on Football Letter Live. Joe, welcome. Thanks for having me, Paul. 
and Josh Starr, you know, he with a last name like that, he was destined for great things. He is also a student general manager for Com Radio, uh, also a broadcast journalism major. Josh is a member of the class of 2020 from Broomall, Pennsylvania. Josh, welcome to the program. Thanks, Paul. Happy to be here with you. And this group gets great faculty guidance from Jeff Brown. If you live here in the State College area, you know his voice very well. Jeff is the Com Radio General Manager. Jeff, welcome in to Football oh, Letter Live. I can't believe you ratted Joe out for crying out loud. That was like a secret. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe he'll get extra credit. As long as my professor isn't here, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if your professor's watching us on the phone. That's how great <laughs> Football Letter Live has become. The following is is worldwide. So, uh, Jeff, let me let me ask you first. Give us some insight into the mission of Com Radio uh, and what the students' responsibilities are. Well, we started in 2002, and the mission has always been to provide as many real world opportunities as we can for our student broadcasters and. You know, for instance, we've had a news team that has been working for months on the presidential election. They're going to be on you know, basically from the time the polls close until 2 a.m. or you know, as long as they can go. Uh, they're going to have reporters throughout the county and have all kinds of different reports there. Um, for the sports side of things, we do every play-by-play -play broadcast of Penn State sports that translates to radio. And by that, I mean there are some sports, uh, you know, gymnastics does not translate to radio. but um, you know, if, if we can call it on the radio, we do. And a lot of times, especially for the football season, we also travel to the away games and we take broadcast crews there as well. You know, they get their, their passes, they get their hotel room, they get all the same and they got to travel because they have to learn to do that when they get out in the real world. So we let them do that here as well. So there's tons of opportunities just with that. And then we've got an arts and entertainment department. We've got uh, sales staff. Uh, what else am I missing? Uh, social media. There's there's all kinds of different people. We have a management team of 18 uh, that's kind of keeping it all together. Uh, a total membership of about 135 or so. And uh, it just keeps growing and getting better and better and better. And I'd like to take credit for it, but I can't. It's the hard work of these three and everybody else behind them at Comrade. They're sensational. One other thing I wanted to say, when I got here uh, this semester, and met with the guys, I said, look, we're not gonna be able to do virtually anything that we're used to doing and in the ways that we're used to doing. It. And I challenged them to be creative. I challenged them to be aggressive. As much as I hate the term, think outside the box, that's what I challenged them to do. And Paul, I'm telling you, I have never been more proud of a group of students because they have not only overcome the restrictions of the COVID-19 virus, they have exceeded it. They've done a phenomenal job. Jeff, you mentioned that the you're going to be covering the election and that they're going to be there until all the results are in. They better bring sleeping bags this year uh, <laughs> for that one. So. Yeah, it could be a two-weeker, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Absolutely. It is amazing what uh, how many students participate so avidly in the hundreds of student organizations, most of them for no credit at all except the experience that they get and the fun that they have. And this is just one of those uh, organizations, one of those uh, nearly a thousand organizations at Penn State. And the students do a fantastic job. It's amazing. Now, Josh is gonna to speak to this a little bit later on, but we're not allowed to be in the stadium uh, to broadcast. And Athletics and Jim Nachman have come up with a way for us to do it that Josh will be addressing. But I want everybody that's watching to understand this is the wave of the future. And so we are providing with the big help of Athletics uh, to provide our students with something to put on their resume that a lot of other student broadcasters will not be able to do. These guys will have uh, lots of experience on this new way of broadcasting, and a lot of their contemporaries will not. Right. And, and uh, they, they've all gotten uh, an extra uh, experience provided by the Alumni Association or opportunities provided by the Alumni Association last year at some of our away games. And we'll talk a little bit about those uh, with them, each of them. Uh, if, uh, yeah. So if I may call upon uh, Derek, first of all, uh, you attended uh, our tailgate at uh, Michigan State last year before the game with uh, 
hundreds of uh, Penn State uh, fans out there from Michigan, uh, our chapters in Michigan, plus uh, ones that travel with us uh, everywhere we go. Uh, and so let me ask, what, uh, what do you feel about, how did you feel about that uh, experience? What stood out about it and what made it uh, special for you, that opportunity out at uh, Michigan State last year, Derek? Well, first of all, I can't say that I could take all the credit because as you can see, Joe was right there next to me through everything. So we did everything together there. We'll but get to you later. The, uh, <laughs> the tailgate was, uh, it was a really great experience there. And it was, uh, honestly, it was really cool because you're on the road, everything's green and white when we were up in East Lansing at the Michigan State game. But then as you walk through the tailgates, you come on this big white tent and inside of it, everyone's Penn State, everything's blue and white. The Nittany Lion was there, the cheerleaders were there it was just a real it was almost it was it was just weird because everything else was surrounded by spartan fans and michigan fans and no one really saw that one coming and then by the time we're there it just seems like in the middle of enemy territory you found all your friends and everyone that you knew and it was just such a really cool experience and i would love to go back in person and i can't wait for us to be back at the games it was the penn state hub out there uh, it in, really was it nothing like it, I swear. Uh, well, let's ask Joe uh, how his Penn State uh, tailgate experience was uh, down in uh, Maryland last year, I believe, right? Joe, is that correct? Yeah, the time in Maryland was yeah. great. And, you know, I think the, the fun thing about it was not only one like, like Derek said, that we got to have a great, you know, chance to host a pregame show to, for, for ourselves and learn how to, um, you know, do these games. But also the fact that we're working with a live audience, you know, there's there's a little bit of uh, showmanship there. You know, you're, you kind of feel like a little bit of an actor at, at a point. You're trying to appeal to a live audience. And that was what was was so much fun about the Penn State tailgates. Like like Derek said, being able to be around Penn State fans when you uh, don't entirely feel like it when you're when you're walking up to the stadium and you're walking through, um, you know, opposing teams tailgates and, and talking about how they're going to beat you guys. But uh, being able to be around Penn State fans has been so much fun. Uh, it was a real blast and, and being able to talk some Penn State football uh, with with all the people that that wanted to hear it. Well, that was uh, that was a little different because that was an indoor tailgate uh, in the yes. uh, Maryland Alumni Center last year, right adjacent to the stadium. Yes, it was. And uh, the uh, I, again, you saw what uh, great spirit and uh, camaraderie there is among Penn Staters at the away games. And we go to an area like the University of Maryland, uh, just on the outskirts of uh, Washington, D.C., from the entire uh, D.C. Uh, and Maryland and Virginia metropolitan area. There's a huge uh, number of Penn State alumni. And as you probably experienced later that day uh, in the stadium itself, at least by uh, the end of halftime, most of the fans left in the stadium <laughs> Uh, at, the, at Maryland last uh, week, were Penn, last year, were Penn State fans uh, with the uh, way that game played out. Uh, do you have any thoughts to offer on that? <laughs> I mean, it was a it was a fun night all around. I'm from Northern Virginia. I'm I'm from the DMV. So being able to be a part of that uh, that Penn State alumni base from from the nation's capital and seeing you know uh, family members and friends that that uh, share that Penn State connection was so much fun. And you know, of course, the the big Penn State win was a, was a nice cherry on top as well. So you see what you've got to look forward to as yes. a Penn State alum. Excited to be and, uh, a part of that crew. Derek, out there in the Pittsburgh area, uh, unfortunately, uh, our series with Pitt has uh, expired at the moment, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll find many opportunities to get together with the alumni in the Pittsburgh area if that's where you wind up after graduation. Uh, okay, Josh, let's uh, give you a chance here. What? Uh, Alrighty. What? Wh let me ask... Uh, how do you use technology uh, to ensure that uh, you can call the games uh, this year? Uh, as Jeff, uh, your uh, advisor, has uh, pointed out, it's going to be a very different kind of year. Uh, how do you, how does that uh, uh, impacted your whole approach and how do you plan to work with the uh, restrictions that uh, are thrust upon you? Yeah, well, um when we were first trying to plan our season, we didn't even know if we were gonna have the chance to call games at all. Um, so 
once we uh, started planning it, uh, as Jeff mentioned, we got in contact with the athletic department. They've helped us out a ton. Um, and we figured out a plan that we're able to still call the games, which is, you know, that's um, why we're part of Com Radio. That's why we want to give people that experience. So um, what, what we're doing different this year, uh, obviously not being able to be in the stadiums, as um, we've mentioned already, the athletic department has given us access to a Zoom with all the different camera angles that they have inside the stadium. So when we're broadcasting, you know, in the stadium, you can see everything. You don't need anyone else to help you out with, with what you're seeing because you're there, you can see everything. But when we're in our studios, that's not the case. So they have helped us out a ton with this, this Zoom that we're gonna have uh, for all the home games that we can see everything happening inside the stadium. Um, so we have that going on. And then also in our, sta uh, in our studio, we have a uh, TV where we're gonna play the actual broadcast of the game that's over whatever network it's on. Um, and then we can combine both of those with um, to, to make it a, a full broadcast so that our broadcasters can see everything like they are still in the stadium. Um, it's been tough to plan. It's been tough to really set up our studio. Um, you know, it wasn't designed for us to have a full game broadcast from inside. So we've had to, you know, put some new things in there. We have to set up a new computer for us to be able to use this Zoom, but we're making it work. We're still getting all these great opportunities from it. Um, and it's going to be great. And um, we're really excited. We um, have also incorporated a little bit of crowd noise that we found um, just to be able to make it sound like we're in the stadium because yep. obviously you listen to a talk show. I'm in a room like this. You can't hear anything else. Um, but right. when you're in the stadium, you can hear all the fans cheering. So we wanted it to sound like we're there and, and like it's um, like it's still a normal atmosphere, at least as much as it can be. So uh, we've done a lot of different things. Um, we've expanded our coverage this year to uh, cover more of the day. Um, and we're just really excited with athletics helping us out and being able to stay on the air for a long time and still be able to call these games, which is really just great experience for everyone involved. That's, that's, fant that's fantastic. Uh, if people want to, sorry, go ahead, John. No, I'm just saying it's a great experience for you and great training. Uh, go ahead. Absolutely. If people want uh, information about how they can listen to you guys on game day, uh, where would they be able to go ahead and find the broadcast that you're talking about? You can, oh, I'll take it. You can find us at PSUCOMMRadio.com. Uh, our coverage on Saturday starts at 9 a.m. Uh, with our uh, national football coverage and then our specific Penn State pregame will start at 6 p.m., uh, run right up to kick. We'll have the game for you there on that, on that website, and then we'll also have an hour worth of postgame afterwards. So, um, yeah, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll definitely be the place to be for, uh, for Penn State football coverage this Saturday on, on PSUcomradio.com, uh, PSUcommradio.com. How many, how many Penn page? State students do you expect to have working this game this weekend? Well, we are going to have uh, our two broadcasters. So I guess if I'm trying to think it on, we're going to have two broadcasters. We've got four people on pregame in the morning. We've got another four doing pregame an hour before, and then we've got another two doing postgame. So yeah, we're probably looking at like around 12, 15 people uh, by the time the day is done, uh, you know, filtering in and out of our studios on Saturday, uh, getting to be a part of our, our football coverage. Great. And John, yeah, okay, bye, uh, bro. Not to mention all the background stuff by you know, Derek uh, puts together a lot of the uh, the production elements and things like that for, uh, previously in the week. So you've got all that happening uh, leading up to the game. So uh, it's we try to get as many people as humanly possible, uh, as much experience as they possibly can get in, in a lot of different ways. You never know when they're going to need it. That's Is fantastic. It okay Josh, that? I'm going to give you the last word here. Sure. Um, First of all, uh, if it's okay with you, Paul, I'm going to share the link to our, our, our website in the chat. Is that okay? Yeah, we already did it. It's already oh. down there. Mel, Mel already took care of that Got while it. you guys were talking about Thank it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we're just super excited to be able to have this opportunity to be able to call the games. Um, 
we're working um, with the athletic department to call some of the other sports later on in the winter and um, spring seasons. Right. And um, just, you know, coming into the, from the summer, we, we weren't sure, like I said, if we were going to be able to have these opportunities, like we've had my first three years here, but we've worked, uh, we worked with the athletic department. We've worked with Jeff and all of the management staff at Com Radio to put these broadcasts together. And uh, I really feel like, this um the pandemic as as hard as it is and as hard as it has been to work around we've come up with new ideas that we've never done before things that we may not have thought of if we didn't have to think outside the box like jeff had mentioned and i really feel like com radio is uh above and beyond what it has been in my th first three years here uh this year i think uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing will continue um in the future and it'll make our coverage of everything like Jeff said, news, sports, and our arts and entertainment department that much better. And I'm just really excited. I'm graduating, so I'll be watching from afar, but I'm really excited to see how it develops once I leave and, and throughout the rest of this year, this year. Well, thank you all for joining us on Football Letter Live. We really appreciate it. Have sure. a great season, and we appreciate all that you're doing uh, to, to keep Penn Staters abreast of what's going on inside the stadium. Thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Well, look, uh, the show continues on, John. Those students are doing some, some really great work. It's always inspiring when we have students on the program to talk about the great experience that they're gaining here at Penn State. It certainly is. Well, yeah. we have another guest with us this evening. Uh, we have um, national champion, uh, Bob White joining us. Let's welcome Bob into the program now. Bob, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Paul. How are you? Hi, John. Hi, Paul. Bob, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. We are we are doing just fine. We are waiting out the pandemic here in State College, like I know mm -hmm. you are. Uh, but let's go back to the early days of of when um, you were first being recruited by Penn State. Um, Talk about how you became a Penn State Nittany Lion. Well, you know, the recruiting process was pretty involved. I mean, back in those days, we were afforded uh, six official visits. Um, my feelings and interest in Penn State was very positive from the very beginning, and it, it never really wavered. Uh, Penn State was always that institution that was out front there. Um, but at the request of some of the other recruiters, I did take five other visits uh, across the country before officially committing here. I went down to, uh, to Pitt. Uh, one of my high school teammates was there at the time. Uh, also went to Ohio State, uh, to Georgia, uh, to South Carolina, and to Florida State. Wow. But there was never really a time that I, that I wasn't convinced that here was where I wanted to be. Great. We're so glad you chose us. So am I. <laughs> but every, everything about uh, the Penn State uh, experience was very positive and it, and, it, and it fit very well with what I was looking for. And I actually felt very, very comfortable with what I was seeing and hearing. Uh, this whole notion of, of college um, was new to me, obviously. Uh, no one in my family had, had attended college, so I didn't ha really have anything to go on. So I was feeling my way along and I wanted to be sure that I was making a good choice and that I was going to be comfortable uh, in, in, a, in an environment where I can achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Bob, your journey to Penn State has been well documented, but if there were uh, persons watching here tonight who may not be familiar with it, uh, let's ask, uh, were you surprised that uh, a college football coach and his wife would be so invested in your academic studies when you got here? And what was it like working with Sue Paterno, uh, getting uh, prepared academically here at Penn State? Well, again, it, you know, it was, it was one of those uh, scenarios where we both were getting comfortable with one another. Um, I was explaining to them where I was coming from and and, and what my goals and dreams and aspirations were. 
And they in turn were doing a very good job of assuring me that if I did choose to come and would commit to the kinds of things that they were looking to, to have happen here that I, that I would be successful and, and they were very convincing in that. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do right away was to hit the ground running. So I started sooner rather than later getting comfortable leading into that fall semester. And uh, once I got started, I never looked back. So it's, it's without question been an incredible positive choice for me to, to have come here. Well, you so certainly, Bobby, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Mm -hmm. well, I was just gonna say, you certainly approved it as uh, your time went on at Penn State, uh, becoming a, a, a co-captain of that great 1986 team and mm -hmm. having participated in the previous years uh, leading up to that great uh, team culminating in 1986. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed immensely watching you uh, do that, watching you perform uh, from a freshman right up to your senior year. Paul. Yeah, yeah as, John, as John mentioned, you were co-captain of that. First of all, 85 team, you run the table, right? Mm -hmm. Disappointing loss against Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. Uh, and then you come back and I've talked to some of your teammates who have talked about the focus of that 86 team it was kind of laser focused on that. Is that how you remember it, Bobby? Take us through kind of the lead up to the 86 team and the focus of, of those uh, lettermen and of those players that were coming back from the 85 team. Yeah, you know, it, it's amazing how the, the entire experience from the beginning to the end was, was all so very much connected. I remember going back even further uh, doing the recruiting process of interacting with the likes of Greg Catuso, Todd Blackledge, uh, Walker Lee Ashley, Kurt Warner. You know, when I was a freshman being recruited and I was interacting with those guys, the vibe was there. I mean, they were, they were talking national championship and they were saying, hey, we need guys like you to help us get it done. I mean, they were serious. I mean, you, you, could, you could sense it. And if you recall, even going back to 81, prior to the 82 yeah, championship, they, they were not far off the mark. Uh, they, they, they lost, they had a tough game there against Miami toward the end of the season. And they find themselves in, in the Fiesta Bowl against uh, Marcus Allen and USC. I mean, they were doing some really great things. So the coaches were very, good at going out and finding a group of guys that were able to come in here in 82, the class that I came in with. And it was a very talented group of guys that were really the ones that Joe sat that year. We redshirted, we ran a scout team and we were getting better every day because we were going against some of the best players in the country in that 82 team that won the 83 championship against Georgia. So we were poised and we had had great leadership to season us to do what we did in 85 and then again in 86. We couldn't have asked for better mentors than the ones that we had. As you worked your way through that uh, 1986 season, Bob, uh, at what point in that uh, season long schedule did you uh, really begin to feel that uh, winning a national title, uh, first of all, was within the reach and then maybe a little farther along, uh, what uh, that it was becoming an expectation that uh, uh, you were going to win. I mean, how strong was the team's focus and resolve as you went through that uh, 1986 schedule? Well, to be honest with you, John, it, it really fortified itself back in 86 when we found ourselves down in South Florida in that locker room, feeling the sting of having lost Oklahoma. You mean 1984? Okay. OK, the, the I mean, it, it, game it, it, January of 86. Yes, that's where it started. Yeah, yeah because right away could, after that loss. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because I can remember coach walking into the locker room and he was as was always the case. He was gut honest with us. He just says, hey, fellas, you, you got licked tonight. That was one of his favorite expressions. You got licked. He says, but you guys can you can make this right. If you make up your minds, you can make this right. And it's up to you guys to decide what you want to do. And it was at that point that all of those core uh, 50 or seniors that could have left, myself included, we committed to one another to come back yeah. and, to get, and to get it taken care of. And one of the most amazing things I remember about that experience was 
we came back to campus and uh, it was, it, it never happened to my knowledge prior to that and didn't happen after that. But coach called all the captains and he called me and John Schaefer and Shane Collin and Steve Smith into his office. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. He says, uh, you guys know what we have to get done. He says, I don't want you out there this spring. You guys, that's not, it's not going to benefit you being out in the spring. He says, but I want you to keep an eye on all the young players, make sure they're doing what they need to do both on and off the field. You guys take care of your conditioning and take care of your academics. And he says, you make sure when you come back in the fall camp, that you guys are ready to do what I know you can get done. And so we're sitting there and I, and we were all not saying anything, but the same thought I know was going through our mind is like, are we hearing what I think we're hearing? Because <laughs> he gave us the entire spring off, which, which never happens. Right. So we say, hey, let's get out of here before, before he changes his mind on this thing. So we got out of there and sure enough, we went off, did what he asked us to do. We came back to camp that fall and everybody was ready to go. Everybody passed all their conditioning tests and that sort of thing. And we, we opened 100 years of Penn State football yes. with, with, with Temple. If you remember, they had the really good uh, running back uh, by the last name of Palmer. Paul Palmer. Paul Palmer, yeah. Yeah, Palmer. And uh, we took off from there and never looked back. Yeah, there, 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 were some, there were some close games along the way. I know I remember the Maryland game where we had to uh, tip a pass away there at the end on a two-point mm -hmm. conversion. But I also remember a big play that you made against Notre Dame to seal the deal, uh, out, sure did. against uh, against the Irish, where you had a late sack that that sealed that victory over Notre Dame. Yeah, there was, as you said, there were several games throughout that season uh, that we needed somebody to step up, and and the beauty of that group of guys, there was always somebody who came through. You know, whether it was Ray Isom or whether it was Timmy Johnson or whether it was Shane Conlon, there was always someone in that group that you can count on. And that was that was the beauty of that group. And we had fun doing it. So it, it's the chemistry was just unbelievable. It was great chemistry. That was important. Yes. I mean, it, you know, here's the thing that that amazes me about the whole experience. And, and it didn't happen with me until years later after I was back here on campus in graduate school you know, working for the university, that it really dawned on me just how incredible that whole experience was. But when we were in the middle of it, because the relationships were so healthy, right. it seemed effortless. And it, it, you know, when I was away from it for a few years, looking back on it, I'm like, we played for three national championships. <laughs> and, and it didn't, it didn't seem like it took a lot of effort. It just, that's just who we were and that's what we did. But it was years later looking back on it that it dawned on me that that was really pretty special. And it's a, the, the healthy relationships and the commitment to one another, the, the, the championships and the victories were a byproduct of that, of, the, of those healthy relationships. That, that yeah. continues to this day. Very Talk a little bit about those relationships. I know in the preparation leading up to tonight, uh, we have mentioned a couple of your teammates, but you said every time you get together with them, it's as if the conversation picks up right where it, right where it left off last time. Talk about the camaraderie of the, that team now, uh, what, uh, almost 30, 40 years ago? 34 later. years, yeah. Right. 30, 30, yeah 30, 34 years ago. But, well... Again, it, it, it was all about football, but it really wasn't about football. For whatever reason, it was just a good group of guys that really re respected one another, uh, truly cared about each other, uh, would go to bat for each other under any conditions, any circumstances. And, you know, we had great leadership from the top down that presented a challenge to us and nobody backed down from it. We, we truly understood what was being asked of us, both from the coach's perspective, from Coach Paterno's perspective, but also from the administration, from the community, I mean, from the alums, we, we bought into what Penn State was all about and, and we wanted to do it proud. We were committed to that. Um, 
and you, it was just such an amazing thing that all these different guys that were recruited and brought in here from different walks of life, different backgrounds, uh, took to one another the way we did. And we were able to laugh and joke and kid around. Um, and it, it just worked. I mean, even sure to this did. Yeah. How about leading up to that climatic game? What uh, are your memories of being at the Fiesta Bowl uh, prior to uh, hitting the field against uh, number one ranked Miami, a game with a, a team with uh, a lot of bravado and uh, feistiness? Uh, how do you, what kind of things do you remember about uh, the whole process, the whole well, uh, bowl week leading up? Very. I think that the things that I remember about that, irrespective of what outsiders, the media and others may have thought, we truly felt like we belonged. Good. Okay. I mean, there was a, there was a strong sense of we belong. And there was also a, a strong sense or commitment that we cannot let this get away from us. This is our shot. This is our last chance at this thing. Um, I can remember thinking in my mind, um, I, I didn't have any questions about the guys to the left and the right of me. I mean, I, I tr we tr truly believed in one another, but I can remember thinking to myself quietly, whatever happens in this game, please do not let it be blown by a bad call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, just, just make, it, make it fair that way and we'll, we'll do our part. Uh, it's one against two. We don't have to worry about the polls or anything of that nature, it's gonna either be won or lost on the field. Yeah. But whatever happens, let's don't let it be blown by a bad call. That was the one thing that was going through my mind, which didn't can, happen, which was great. Yeah, I can remember what a great uh, uh, feeling there was among the team leading up to that. I remember the uh, big Penn State pep rally at uh, the Camelback Inn mm -hmm. uh, a couple of days before the, the game itself. Mm -hmm. uh, when thousands of uh, Penn State uh, fans were gathered out there all around the, uh, the swimming pools and that uh, we had the band there and the mm -hmm. cheerleaders and the spirit was just amazing among all the alumni. Right. The team really seemed fired up, but at yep. the same time, they seemed loose and very comfortable yep. going into that. And, and I can understand you had that confidence of, of uh, going in there. It uh, certainly was a great uh, lead up to the performance that you guys uh, put out there on the field. You know, it's, it, and this is, a, I'm gonna tell you something, I'm getting chills just talking about it because when I, when I get in the right situations and talk about it, it, it takes you back. And, and there's two things I remember that really sticks out of my mind. The one thing I remember is sensing the tension in the locker room. Because one of the things that, that, that Joe had done leading up to that game, because he knew the type of opponent we were dealing with, he had pulled us aside weeks and weeks earlier and said, you guys will, will not get into a jawing match with this group. So you just keep your mouth shut. We're out here to take care of business. And so we don't want to get into that with the media running our mouth. So there was that pinup anticipation because we couldn't really vent it any other way. That was the, the first thing. And then the second thing I remember was when he came into the locker room pregame and he got up on the lockers and he did that typical gesture that he does. He took his hands and he could calm down, calm down, quiet down. Okay. And he got our attention and he looked at us and he said, I want to tell you guys something. It's been exactly a year and a day ago that you were where you are tonight, going back to the Penn state orange bowl game against Oklahoma. He said, it's right. been a year and a day ago. And he says, I told you guys, if you just do what I ask you to do, you could get this done. He says, now you're back here. Don't let it get away from you. No. And, and, and I, the guys just could not wait to get out of that locker room because all week long, everybody had to zip it, <laughs> practice, focus. Right. And when we came out into that desert air that night yeah. and those flashes start going off, I mean, it was as if you were walking on air. I mean, I knew everybody was ready to play football. Yep. I knew we were ready. Great. Bob, it's, it's well documented the game and, and how that went and how you took down another Heisman Trophy winner and Vinny Testaverde. Take us to the return trip home. 
the the plane touches down in Harrisburg and you guys get on the buses mm -hmm. and you're driving through all the small towns that you have to drive through mm -hmm. and the reception that you all received all the way back into State College. Talk a little bit about, about those moments. Again, it, all of it was overwhelming, even the Harrisburg airport. And like you said, from that airport, there was a crowd there. There was the, the governor of the state. Uh, there were times along the way from Harrisburg back to State College, we literally had to stop the buses. You know, <laughs> just the, the crowds, the Not fire the engines. Right? I mean, it was, it was all of our victory. It was the university. It was the state of Pennsylvania. It was all these little communities that were so on fire about what had happened and what was happening. And so it was just truly touching to see that we had that much support behind what we had been striving to accomplish and what we actually achieved. It was, it's, you never forget it. What do you think, Bob, uh, is the legacy of that team? What legacy did that, leave, that team leave for Penn State? Well, I, I think the, the, the legacy for me is that um, it just goes to show you what can truly happen when, when you get a group of people who are truly being unselfish. They, they're willing to forget about self and truly commit to an idea or a goal for the greater cause. And, and I think that group of guys, they, they, they exemplified that. They, we had a bunch of unselfish individuals who weren't worried about their individual stats, weren't worried about who was gonna get the credit. We were Penn State, period. Right. Period. <laughs> and that's all that mattered. So when we said, when we would, we, the fans would cheer, we are, we truly were what Penn State, what we came in here understanding what Penn State was all about. It's not about individuals. Right. And, and Joe always taught us and coach always said, you always have to remember that the cause is bigger than any one of you. And so we had a, a bunch of guys that bought into that and we're all singing from the same music. And let me tell you, when that happens, when that happens, there's nothing that compares to it. That experience was what it was because it was about all of us. It continues to be about all of us. And I think if there's any one thing that, that I would love to see con continue to be part of permeating our, our world around us is that idea of we and us, you know, losing that individuality, because I think that's where things like what we experienced and what we accomplished doesn't happen when you have a bunch of individuals. That's what a team is. It certainly is. Mm -hmm. right. Bobby, we are running out of time, but I don't want to let you leave us without um, asking you about the 30 plus year relationship that you had with Coach Paterno and uh, any, any great stories that, that come to mind uh, that, you could, that you would share with the audience tonight about, about Coach? Well, I mean, that's a long list. I, I yeah. think the, the, one, the, the one thing I think I can speak for others that knew him and, and, and played for him and, and so forth is that there was a consistency about him. Um, so I think that's what made it easy to, to, to play and to play hard for him because he, he, was, he was consistent. You always knew what you were dealing with and you always knew where he was coming from. And that was very, very much appreciated. Um, and as long as you understood that and, and, and came out onto his practice fields or into his uh, strength and conditioning room and, and did what you needed to do in the classroom and so forth, everything was fine. He, you knew what he expected. Um, and you knew why he expected it. And he was very clear in where he was coming from. That's great. Bobby, thanks for joining us tonight on Football Letter Live. Your accomplishments while here uh, and, and throughout your career, which we didn't get to, but you, you have lived now a life of service to Penn State and, uh, and your, your life has certainly swelled thy fame of dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. Well, let me just say this. It's a two-way street. Penn State's been good to me too. So, and again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's, it's, it goes both ways. So thank you so much for having me.
Absolutely. Thank you for being our guest. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, that's just about all the time we have tonight, John, on Football Letter Live. As a reminder, this week on the Football Letter blog, we highlighted the 1986 team. You can read that feature at footballletter.com. That's thefootballletter.com. Uh, we'll put that link in the chat box there. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member, go online today and join at alumni.psu.edu, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. We are wrapping up our time this evening, though we can keep the conversation going on social media. Visit us on Facebook and let us know what about Penn State you're grateful for. We're uh, coming up on, on November and Thanksgiving time. We'll be here right around the corner. What are you grateful for from a Penn State perspective? Use the hashtag Hashtag FBL Live, that's FBL Live on Facebook or your other social media channels. We have another busy week. Next week at the Alumni Association, nine o'clock, our, our coffee hour guest is retired Brigadier General Greg Tuhill. He's one of the nation's premier IT and cyber leaders. Um, additional information can be found on our website again at alumni.psu.edu. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, John great show tonight and thank you to our guests for joining us and for all you do for the university for the glory and for the future we are Penn State. Penn State. thanks guys <laughs>